Okay. So here's the, um, uh, let's see, okay, so last talk before lunch. How many people here work with JavaScript? <laughs> cool, okay, keep everyone awake. Um, how many people here heard my talk this morning? Wow, I must have done well, you came back. <laughs> That's kind of not so good because the first five slides are the same, but it kind of sets the context. Kind of sets the context for what I'm going to talk about. I think this will, so the talk this morning and this talk are brand new talks. Um, so that's always fun, except I was up till three in the morning doing them. Um, but uh, they're good talks. And I think it's going to be a little short, but that'll be good. We'll get a little more time for lunch. And. I want you to pay less attention to the content of the slides and more attention to the background photos. Because that's really where a bulk of my time is spent. <laughs> you think I'm joking. I go, OK, this next one is about short cache times. What's the background photo? Something with a clock or an hourglass. And then I go on Flickr, search for hourglass, creative commons. It takes a long time. Um, so this one, you know, snippets really are not fast. Uh, so there's kind of a, you know, meaning to the, to the photo is we're, you know, when I started working on performance eight years ago, um, I remember the first team that I went to talk to about making their website faster said, you know, there's nothing we can do. You know, I was at Yahoo at the time. Yahoo doesn't own an ISP and Yahoo doesn't own a browser. What do you want, to, the team said, what do you want us to do? There's nothing we can do. And the assumption was that, you know, our life, our, uh, you know, in our cases as web programmers, our web presence, the presence of our website was out of our control. And, you know, so I've spent the last eight years finding ways to work around the system to figure out what's really taking the most amount of time and of those things, what do we control? And how can we kind of contort things to work that way? And in fact, um, it, uh, uh, in the second half of the talk, I'll talk about this thing, self-updating scripts, that Stoyan Stefanov and I just released a couple weeks ago. And the typical response to that is, that is such an amazing hack. It is so ugly. And so I'm not sure how to take that. But it is true, like some of the times, I'll, the ways to work around the system are uh, not always elegant. Sometimes they're more pragmatic. And so I think it's the same situation here, and you'll see it in this talk, in these slides, that there's a lot of things we don't control about um, snippets, about third-party content that we're embedding in our sites. But there is a lot that we actually do control, or can control, or can push for. And certainly, we always have the choice of just removing the snippet if we feel like it's uh, bad for our site. And I know that there are um, big websites who have removed snippets, and the people who own those snippets, large, large companies, have responded to that as like, well, what? Can, and they've removed them because of performance. And, and large companies have responded to that. What can we do about that? So, uh, if you're a big company and you're relying on some third-party content and you don't think the performance is good enough threaten to drop it. And if you're a small company, maybe we should form some kind of co-op or something to channel all of our, our uh, traffic together and, and, and vote as a proxy block. So I'm going to talk about high-performance snippets, how to try to take um, little small things and make them fast. So in the talk this morning, I picked Business Insider. And the reason for this is I, I mentioned that I was at Velocity China um, in December. And you know, behind the great firewall, and I've got these 30 websites um, that I open up every morning. You might have heard this anecdote before. I uh, go into work, uh, hook up the laptop, I open this um, web page I have with some JavaScript on it, and I hit go, and it opens 30 tabs. It opens all the websites that I read in the morning, and while those are loading, because I can't stand waiting for websites to load, I get up and I go get breakfast. And when I come back, it's about done loading those 30 websites. So we still have to do a better job. And this is one of the websites that I read every morning. And so I did this in China. And I uh, actually wasn't getting breakfast. I was um, sitting in the front row of the conference while someone was speaking. And 
And so I was looking at it, and it was blank for like 60 seconds. And I think I was using, this morning I mentioned a timeout of 20 seconds for IE. Um, I think I was using Chrome or Safari. Uh, one of those, it's 120 seconds for a timeout. So I'm looking at this screen, and it was white for 120 seconds. And it really got me thinking about, oh, I know what's happening. It's this front-end spoth, the single point of failure that I've talked about before. So that's how I stumbled upon Business Insider. Anyone here work at Business Insider? If you did, would you raise your hand? <laughs> Probably not. So I look at this page, and I know right away that there are single points of failure, even before I look at the source code. But then I look at the source code, and I verify it. So it's got snippets in there, the Facebook Like button. Uh, it's got ads. And it's also got analytics in the middle. And all of those are single points of failure for the website. Not in the normal sense we think of as like a server overheating or a disk drive crashing. It's in the sense from the user's perspective. Um, and it has to do with blocking. All of those pieces of third-party content um, are being loaded, at, not all of them, but many of them are being loaded as synchronous scripts. And if you have a synchronous script, basically that means if it's script source equals file name, then um, it blocks all elements below that script tag. Style sheets are actually worse. Style sheets will block all elements in the page. So if you put style sheets at the bottom, I remember when I was working on the first book and I found that rule about moving scripts to the bottom, I tried that with style sheets. And it was the worst thing possible because style sheets will block everything in the page from rendering, below it and above it. And so we put it at the bottom, which meant that the style sheet loaded last. And so the page was blank for a really long time. And then we go, oh, I guess it doesn't matter whether it's above or below. So we put it at the top so it loads really fast so the page can render. So it happens for both of them. But for scripts, it's just the elements below the script tag. And that happens in all browsers. So it has this blocking behavior. And this is what I saw when I was in Beijing for Business Insider for like two minutes, 120 seconds. It was like this. It was white. And to me, like, that's a failure. That's, you know, especially if it's 20 seconds for IE, maybe the user will hang on that long. 120 seconds, there's no way the user's going to hang on that long. And so if we look at the source code, I apologize if you can't read this. The slides are on my website. If you go up there, I've got links uh, to the slides. Um, so it's loading Quantcast asynchronously. I actually didn't know Quantcast had an async snippet. I think a year ago they didn't, so that's great. Uh, it's loading Google Analytics asynchronously. It's loading KISS metrics asynchronously. But then it's loading this Twitter uh, anywhere.js synchronously. The really ironic thing is they don't actually use it in the page. <laughs> There's nowhere that they access this code. But they probably use it on other pages. And so it just got into the template. And they're pulling it down. And it's blocking their entire site, in China at least. Um, so they're loading this synchronously, and that's going to produce a failure. It's going to produce a failure in China 100% of the time. Um, and it's going to produce failures here when there's an outage for Twitter. right? And we think, well, maybe that doesn't happen. That does happen. right? And I just don't just mean Twitter. Google has outages. Facebook has outages. Everyone has outages. That's a fact. So, And even if it doesn't produce a failure in the sense of a 20-second or 120-second blank page, if it's slow to respond, then it's going to impact the user experience. It's just going to degrade it. If it takes five seconds, five seconds isn't that bad of a response time for a script. Imagine your entire page being blocked for five seconds by this one script. Like You wouldn't want that. And loading it synchronously like this is going to produce that experience some percentage of time. So I call this front-end SPA, front-end single point of failure. I think it's really important. I wrote this blog post two years ago, but we're still not paying enough attention to this topic. So that's why I'm hammering on it uh, here today. So here's Business Insider inside web page test. How many people here use web page test? So it should be higher than that. You'll find there's so many things you do with web page test. Please go check it out, webpagetest.org. Um, so I'm loading businessinsider.com. And it doesn't render for 30 seconds. And that's because I did this inside China. 
and it's blocking Twitter.com. I don't know if they do this intentionally, if they make it time out as opposed to just returning some failure code. Certainly, if they want to discourage, they being the owners of the Great Firewall, if they want to discourage traffic to Twitter.com, this is a great tactic to do that, is don't fail right away. Make them hang on for 20 seconds or two minutes before you fail. Uh, it certainly drives me crazy. Um, so that's what's happening. So one thing you could do, so I, I, I'll bet that almost every website that is being worked on by people in this room has a front end single point of failure. One thing you could do is you could go uh, to web page test and load your site inside uh, a web page test location inside China. And you could see if you get this blank rendering. But it's possible that the widget you're using is not blocked by the great firewall. For example, uh, Google, Google.com is blocked. Google-analytics.com is not. So GA is still a single point of failure uh, for my website. But it won't be caught by testing it this way from China. So Pat Meenan, the guy who created and, and runs web page test, realized that. And he said, he's kind of with me. We're, he's doing some talks about uh, front end spoff, uh, I think, at Velocity. And so he's been banging on this as well. And he said, well, why don't we create a black hole? So he did. Blackhole.webpagetest.org. There's the IP address. Here's his blog uh, where he talks about it. And Basically, what you can do, and he's got all of this in, in the blog post there, you can do the Etsy host trick. You can pick the uh, third-party domains that you have in your website, whatever they are, and just map them to that black hole uh, IP address, right? And then restart, and, and everything will go through the black hole. And you'll see anything on those domains should time out, but you'll see if it degrades the performance of your website or not. If you're doing everything async, it shouldn't be a problem. If you're doing things synchronously, loading scripts synchronously, you're going to see uh, a blank page, or at least blank parts of your page. But the other nice thing is you can also do the same thing in web page test. Um, you can take these. He's got a simple pat, has a simple scripting language. And so you can take these lines um, to set the DNS name to, again, any third-party domain that you have in your site to see if you have a uh, critical path dependency on that. And then at the end, just say navigate and put in the URL to the site you're trying to test. So uh, I did that here. And here's how you do it. Here's the web page test UI. And there's this, um, you know, and Pat will make no, Pat will make all the apologies for the uh, UI here. It's definitely not a beautiful UI. But you get used to it. So there's this script tab, and in there you can uh, enter commands for this simple scripting language he has. And this scripting language also lets you do things like uh, workflow, like you know, buy something through a shopping cart, log into websites, multiple things. It's pretty powerful but simple. So I've put in these commands to map these, uh, to do this DNS mapping. And then instead of looking at Business Insider, I want to uh, switch over and look at my website. Oh, you can see there up in the upper right, if you go to my website, there's the links to the morning's talk about single point of failure and this afternoon's talk, this talk about uh, snippets. Um, so just last week, I added the uh, Twitter profile widget to my page. So you can see it right here. It's got the last three. Wow, you can see I actually finished these slides about 15 minutes before the talk. So you can see it's got my tweet there from earlier this morning. Um, so I've got this in there, right? Now, when I added it, it was synchronous, right? That was the snippet that Twitter gave me. And so if I run it through web page test with those DNS mappings, I'm going to see this timeout. So I had DNS mappings for Google Analytics and uh, TWIMG.com uh, going to the black hole. So those two requests fail. And what we see up in the film strip view is we don't see a blank page. We see this part of the page is being blocked from rendering until about sometime between 20 and 30 seconds, this part of the page in the circle. Why is that? Remember what I said is 
that the way that scripts block rendering is every DOM element below them in the page is blocked from rendering. Well, in this case, if you remember, the uh, Twitter profile widget is about in the middle of my page. It's right there in that second column below the links to my books, which everyone should buy. And, and so that's why it's blank until about 30 seconds, because at 30 seconds is when those requests time out, because I'm still in IE, which has a 20 second timeout for those requests. So it didn't hit my entire page, but it certainly impacted the user experience. I've got three columns here. You can see the third column cut off there. Um, so the, the second half of the second column and the entire third column were blocked from rendering because of this Twitter widget that I put in there. So what can we do about that? Um, the main thing I would say is give up because it's third-party content. There's nothing we can do, right? Well, no, I don't believe in that. So here's the original snippet. This is what they gave me. Uh, so you can see script source equals uh, Twitter widget.js. So it's blocking. I know it's blocking. I know if there's ever an outage, it's going to affect my website. If it's ever slow, it's going to affect my website. So what can I do about that? Well, the obvious thing to do is loaded async. So it's a little bit of code, but I don't know, add it up. What is it, 10 lines of code? It's not that bad. So first off, I've got the, I've never, Matt Muhlenweg gave me this pointer for Christmas a couple years ago. I've never used the laser on it. Ooh. That's kind of fun. So first of all, we got the typical snippet down here, you know, which I'll credit to Google Analytics. I think they're the ones who really made this really popular. There's a couple of blog posts I wrote about append child versus insert before and things like that. Why does it say this async equals true? So we're creating the element. Um, and here I'm adding an onload handler, this do Twitter function that I'll get to in a minute. And I set the source, and then I insert it into the DOM, right? So that gets the script loaded. I'm loading the, now I'm loading the widget script asynchronously, so it's not going to block my page anymore, even if I'm in China. But I had to do this callback. The callback's a little tricky. I have to do ready state for IE. Um, but there's also this case where Opera will call onload and ready state. So I want to, uh, the first time I actually call it, I want to set both of those to null, so it will never be called twice. And then I'm going to do the code that they gave me before. I'm going to call the Twitter widget. So this is a way that I can load this asynchronously, but make sure that the dependent code doesn't execute until this is finished loading successfully. All make sense? So that's beautiful. We're basically done, right? There's one thing you got to think about with defer or async, and that is you can't load a script asynchronously or deferred if it does document.write. Now, like you, I never do use document.write generally. Um, but it turns out that uh, Twitter's widget.js does use document.write. Here they have this. Here they have this. Whoop, there we go. Boom. Here they have this where they're writing in the div that the widget is actually, the profile widget is going to be contained in. They're doing that with document.write. Eh, they could have used a different technique, but um, that's OK. So. But one thing I notice here is it says it only does this document dot write if there's no ID property of X. And if you look at the code, and I don't know how many people know this, Chrome uh, DevTools has a uh, prettify link for scripts. So of course this code is all minified. I prettify it, and I can you know actually make it somewhat readable. X is um, that set of properties that I'm passing in to the call to the widget. So all I have to do is set an ID, and it won't call this document.write. And my guess is it's not going to create it, because it assumes that the div already exists. So what if we create the div ourselves and pass in the ID? So let's try that. So the only changes to what I had before is I'm going to add the div myself. I'm going to give it the ID Souders Twitter. I'm going to add that property into the list of properties that I pass into the call to instantiate the widget. And lo and behold, it works. So you know, this is maybe somewhat risky. I get a fair amount of traffic to my site, but not a huge amount. And people kind of understand I'm trying stuff on it. 
So I'm okay with this. If you go to my site now and you put in a query string, Twitter equals one, you'll get this async version of the Twitter widget so you can compare them. Uh, so I'm going to swap that out. I'm okay with it. It could be a little risky, like I looked and I couldn't find this ID property in the documentation for their API. So it's possible they might change that out from under me later and it might not work anymore. I don't know, but I'm not too nervous about it. I actually think this is a, a pattern that more and more third-party snippets should adopt, is it at least having the option of passing an, uh, an ID to the container. Um, because many of them are using document.write to do that, to write out a div or an iframe that they're going to put their snippet inside of. So this is very cool. I basically um, you know, had this terrible uh, spoff behavior where the right-hand half of my page uh, didn't render for 20 seconds if there was a timeout, if there was an issue with Twitter. And now with this async version, I still don't get the uh, it, it, just to be clear, the, the uh, time frame before was tens of seconds, uh, 0, 10, 20, 30. So this might not look that much better, but it's an order of magnitude better. One, two, three. The page is rendering. In fact, all of the page, except for the Twitter widget, is rendering by three seconds. Now, the Twitter widget still isn't going to render because I'm, I'm using the black hole. The black hole is still going to uh, have timeouts for Google Analytics and Twitter. But what I've done here is I've separated this single point of failure out of my website. If Twitter goes down, the Twitter widget will be down, but the rest of my page is going to be fine. And in fact, it's going to continue to be fast. If Twitter is slow, it's not going to affect my website. So it's not just about outages. It's also about how performant they are. And I'm going to write, a, I found some interesting stuff last night at 3 in the morning about how fast and slow these third-party widgets are responding to the HTTP archive. When you do 200,000 uh, page views, uh, different pages, you make a lot of requests to those widgets. So there's a lot of data in there about the um, average and median uh, and distribution of the response times for these widgets. And it's really important to look at that. You know, it might be great that a third-party widget has a, a really fast median time, but if their 95th percentile is over 5 or 10 seconds, that's pretty bad. To think about 5 or 10% of your users are going to have some blocked behavior of rendering for 5 or 10 seconds is not really good. And so if you're loading third-party scripts synchronously, um, you really need to think about how to get out of that. More and more snippet providers are offering async versions, but if not, you can try to figure out a way to do it yourself. Putting it inside an iframe is another idea. So that was really cool. Now, how did this happen? How did it happen? The guys at Twitter, man, they wrote a great blog post yesterday. I don't know if you read that, about how they're moving more of their rendering server side to make it faster. They say they've cut the page load times by 80%. So they're smart guys. They're doing great work over there. But you know, how did this happen? One, I think snippets you know, are second fiddle. Um, you know, they don't get my apologies to anyone who played second fiddle in high school. It's just an expression. Uh, my guess is that, you know, that it, gets, it doesn't get the primary focus of attention. So if we look at the um, documentation, for, I think this is for anywhere.js. Uh, it says, while placing JavaScript files at the bottom of the page is best practice for website performance. I wonder who mentioned that. Um, when including the anywhere.js file, always place the file as close to the top of the page as possible. Wow, that should like immediately raise red flags for anyone who cares about performance. We know that scripts block everything below them. If you put it at the top of the page, it's going to block everything in the page. The anywhere Now, they kind of rationalize this by saying the Anywhere.js file is small. It's only 3K. You know what? If it was 50 bytes, it wouldn't matter. If it takes five seconds to get that response, it's still going to block my page, whether it's 50 bytes, 3K, 30K. It's still going to block my page. So it's still a front-end single point of failure. It doesn't matter that it's GSIP and it's small. And they're obviously aware of these issues because they then go on to mention that all of the subsequent resources that are used by the features of Anywhere are loaded asynchronously, and so they won't impact performance. And I see this over and over and over again. I love to visit with people 
who are creating the first version of their third-party snippet. And about half the time, they go down this path. Well, we got a lot of code, and do do do. We'll load it. You know what we'll do? We'll create a bootstrap script that's very small, and that will dynamically load the other stuff. And so if we have to change the other bulk of the code, we can do it dynamically with that bootstrap script. And we'll just make that one small bootstrap script um, load synchronously. You know what? I don't really care if I'm loading something small or big. I don't really care whether it's one thing or four things. If your site is down or overloaded and it's timing out, whether I make one request or four requests, it's going to time out my page. Whether it's big or small, it's going to time out my page. It's going to degrade the user experience. So it's really bad to have any third-party content that's loaded synchronously. So three things about this, about what they just said. My, my response, three things. I know failures happen. Hiccups, outages, they happen. You can't avoid it. Whether I'm doing a normal request, getting a 200 response, or a conditional get request using if modified sense, if none match, both of those, if they time out, are going to block the page. So it doesn't really matter whether it's a 200, a conditional get request or not. Anywhere.js expires after 15 minutes. It's a pretty short cache time. If you read like my recommendations, it's like 10 years in the future. I think uh, Google PageSpeed recommends at least a month. 15 minutes, that's really short. So if we look, this is kind of typical for the third party, the most popular third party bootstrap scripts out there. Um, Widgets.js from Twitter is, has a cache time of 30 minutes. Uh, All.js from Facebook, 15 minutes. Google Analytics, two hours. I think they've actually just raised that um, recently. Pretty short. And um, this is true of most bootstrap scripts. Why is that? Uh, what's going to happen is every 15 minutes or every 30 minutes or every 120 minutes, the browser is going to make a conditional get request to see if there's an update. Now, because it's making so many requests, and because a conditional get request can produce front-end SPOF just as any other request, it means the likelihood of SPOF happening to the user is going up. It's going up a lot. If you have something that's cacheable for a month versus 15 minutes, the number of opportunities for front-end SPOF is going up two orders of magnitude. So why do people do this? Why do these third parties do this? It's because they are worried that they're going to make a change to their snippet and they want to make sure that the user gets that change. But there's no way for them to modify the URL, to add a query string or anything like that to the snippet on someone else's page, so they give it a short cache time. And that means at least every 30 minutes, the user is checking to see if there's an update. If you look at the median change time of these uh, scripts, it's like on the order of a week, two weeks. So they don't change that frequently. To think of someone doing it every 30 minutes when they're visiting the website, that's you know, just too much overhead, especially given the, the front-end spoff dangers. So I stopped and I said, is there any way that we could have our cake and eat it too? Could we have longer cache times for these bootstrap scripts, but also ensure that users get updates if there's some emergency fix? So I came up with this thing I call self-updating bootstrap scripts. There's a blog post to it. Another great photo. Um, so there's two parts to this technique. Uh, the, first, the assumption is, and this won't be true for all snippets, but it's true of every snippet I've seen, is that we're going to assume that the snippet includes some other dynamic request to the server, to the snippet server, like a beacon for logging or a JSON request to get back some uh, dynamic data, number of uh, likes or something like that. And a lot of times, um, uh, and so the other thing is we need to add a version number to these snippets, and we need to pass that in this dynamic request back to the snippet server. And the snippet server can now look at that version number, and the snippet server has awareness of what the current version of the uh, snippet is. And if it's version 127 is the current version, the server can just return a 204 response or whatever JSON data it normally would. But if there is a new version, then um, the response for this dynamic request 
can actually notify the client that there is a new version available and trigger an update. So that's the first part of the problem, how to update the client that there's a new version available if we're not using caching. So we can do that using this technique, assuming the snippet has some other request that is dynamic and, and not read from cache. Then the second part of the problem is overriding that bootstrap script that's in the cache. Now the assumption here is we've given this bootstrap script a far future expiration date. I wouldn't set it for 10 years, but I would change it to maybe a week. Going from 15 minutes to a week is gonna be a good improvement on performance and uh, reducing the probability of front end spoff. So if there's this bootstrap script that is cacheable for another week, how can we overwrite that with a new version, right? So that's the tricky part. So I thought of some ways to do it. You could like dynamically re-request it, do an image request, or even a dynamic JavaScript request. But if it's cacheable for another five days, that dynamic request is just gonna read it from cache. Well, so then you could twiddle the URL. You could add a query string with the current time or something like that. Yeah, that will make the request, but it will write it to the cache with the query string. So the next time the page is executed and it executes the snippet with the bare bones URL, it's still gonna read the outdated version from the cache. So that's not gonna work. Um, so then you can use an XHR. XHR has this set request header. You can do like a pragma no cache, set some other uh, cache headers, must revalidate. Um, you can do that, but I tried that and it doesn't work across some major browsers. So I was kind of stuck here. So I had been talking to Stoyan Stefanov. He and I used to work at Yahoo together. And now he's over at Facebook. And I was describing this problem. I said, you know, Google has it. Facebook has it. It'd be great if we could solve this. And I emailed him you know, late at night, said, I've tried these things. I'm stuck. And he said, oh. And the next morning, he replied. And he sent me this email. Hey, I tried this, and it seems to work. Create an iframe dynamically that hits the snippet server. The response to that iframe contains the bootstrap script in it, and then programmatically reload the iframe. When you reload the iframe, a reload, like when you click the reload button, will re-request everything in the page as a conditional git request. So it'll do a conditional, even though it has the bootstrap script in the cache for another five or seven days, it will re-request it with a conditional, with a if modified since header, and the server will say, well, yeah, it has been modified since. I've got an updated version for you, and it will download the updated version and overwrite the bootstrap script in the cache with the new version. So we've achieved our goal. So let's look at an example. That was kind of complicated, and I encourage you to hit this, uh, look at the blog post or hit this example and try it out, but I'm gonna walk through it in slides. So we're going to load a bootstrap script. This is just a contrived example. I've got this bootstrap script called bootstrap.js. And it's cacheable for a week, right? So I'm going to load that dynamically in some page. And when it loads, it's going to send a beacon. Let's pretend that this is like Google Analytics or some other logging uh, snippet. It's going to send a beacon. And I'm going to make sure in the beacon to specify the version number. In this case, I have a version number as a timestamp. Um, now, the beacon can respond with a 204 if there's no new version of bootstrap.js, but if there is a new version, it can actually return JavaScript. So when I request this beacon, I'm not requesting it as a new image, I'm requesting it as a dynamic script. If it returns a 204, it's no biggie. If it does return content, that script is actually executed. The thing I love about this technique is, if the worst thing is you get a bug in the updating behavior, and that updating behavior code is in the cache, you're screwed. So here, the updating behavior is being downloaded from the server as part of this dynamic beacon. So we can always control the most critical part of the process. So the beacon returns this code that dynamically creates an iframe that hits this update.php with the version number. Update.php can have awareness of, what, uh, of whether this version number is um, current or not. And if it's not, then it can return uh, content in the page that contains bootstrap.js. So let's look at that. So here's the iframe response. It's got uh, bootstrap.js in it. And then it has this code that is going to reload the page just once. It will use the hash string as a way to pre prevent infinite reloading. And when it reloads the page, the browser will make a conditional get request for this script 
and update it with the new version in the cache. So we've uh, solved the problem. We can set long cache times for these bootstrap scripts, and we can get an update when there is a new update available. And we don't have to do this every 15 or 30 minute polling, which is generating more load on our servers and a worse user experience and a higher likelihood of front end spoff. We can just get the update when it's available. So there are some caveats. To the, to the two main ones I want to mention is the first one is this update cycle is a lot like app cache. I'm going to load a page that has a version of bootstrap.js in the cache, which turns out is outdated as of this current instant. But I loaded the page, and it read it from cache, and it used that version. And then I'm going to download this new version, but the user won't get that until they go to the next page view. So it's a lot like app cache. I'm going to use the version in cache right now, and then I'll, if there is an update, I'll update my cache, and the user will get that on the next time. So this, depending on uh, your user metrics, your uh, session dynamics, this might actually produce uh, more um, up-to-date beacons being sent or fewer. Uh, so it's kind of a plus and minus. It's not necessarily uh, a good or bad thing. And the other problem is people have already deployed this. I wrote this blog post a couple weeks ago. And uh, someone reported an issue where in IE8 it was opening that iframe in a new tab. And so I'm still investigating that um, to figure out. I can't. No one can reproduce it, but we had some user reports of that. But overall, it looks like a pretty good technique. So I'm about done. Let me wrap up. Um, takeaways. Uh, if you have any third-party scripts in your page, make sure you're not lo loading them synchronously in a blocking way. Um, uh, there are ways to work around that. Uh, even if it has to be blocking, you could move it to the bottom of the page if possible, but try to get around that and try to encourage, and if you try to encourage the snippet owners to offer an async version, or if you own a snippet, make sure you offer an async version. Test your site with blackhole.webpagetest.org and uh, be aware of the front end single points of failure that your site has. Something I didn't mention is it's likely that if you're experiencing front end spoff on your site, it's not being reflected in any of your metrics because most real user metrics fire after the onload event. And if a user is looking at the page for 20 or 120 seconds, they're not going to wait for onload. Or a significant percentage of them aren't going to wait. So you won't necessarily see this bad uh, behavior reflected in your RUM metrics. And uh, if you own any bootstrap scripts of your own, um, try to uh, use this self-updating pattern and make them so you can add a longer cache time. And then I just want to plug next month, uh, I'll be co-chairing with John Allspa um, Velocity uh, here in Santa Clara, and we'll have more stuff about performance. And that's it. Thank you.